Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Berry, and I'm pastor of the First Presbyterian Church in Granitville, Vermont. The message I am bringing you today is a message that was originally premiered on March 28, 2020. This was shortly after COVID had hit, and we had closed the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville to in-house worship services as a way of fighting the COVID pandemic. This message was presented to the public the week before Palm Sunday. I'm bringing it to you as it is one of the highest viewed messages that we have presented. I think you'll find it well worth your time to sit and view it. I will be from time to time, as the need arises, replaying some of my past messages. On March 28, 2020, many of you may not have been viewing our weekly messages and you may have missed some really good ones. I have redone the opening of the message and added some music to the closing, but the rest of the video is just as we presented it on March 28, 2020. So please enjoy this message and be thankful that at the First Presbyterian Church in Graniteville, we are holding weekly in-house worship services every Sunday at 10 a.m. as of July 4th, 2021. We'd love to have you join us for a worship on a Sunday morning in-house so we'd get a chance to meet you in person. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy this service. The title today of my message is, Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich. Uh, as a pastor, I'm always trying to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit about what he would have me preach. One night uh, this last week, I had a dream where I was singing this song, Give Thanks, to someone in my dream over and over again. Someone who needed to hear this message, and I just felt compelled in my dream to keep singing it over and over and over again. Uh, when I woke up in the morning, I told my wife Brenda about the dream. She was very patient and listened to my story, and I dream a lot. Uh, and uh, But I kept thinking about it. I couldn't get it out of my head. Uh, what a powerful dream it was. About 20 minutes later, I got an instant message from a friend who had sent me this song, Give Thanks, by Don Moen, and a little video clip. And I knew then that God wanted this message to be part of my message to you today. The message today comes from the lyrics of this song written by Don Moen and Paul Wilbur. I'm not going to sing it for you because I want you to come back next week and listen uh, to what I have to say. The title of it is Give Thanks. Let me just read to you the lyrics uh, to part of this song. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. And then it goes on and repeats that verse once again. Now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Now, this song is based on some spiritual truths, uh, and they come from a composite of a, a few scriptures and promises and truths that you'll find in scripture. The first is from Joel chapter 3, verse 10, which says, Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Joel, the prophet, was a prophet who had a message from the kingdom for the kingdom of Judah at that time. It was a message about how the people needed to stand up and fight against oppression by transforming their farming tools into weapons of warfare and to transform, transform their weaknesses with a confession of strength. Let the weak say, I am strong. The biblical meaning of the term prophet is one who speaks forth or openly a, a proclaimer of a divine message, hence in general, a prophet who was once who were the Spirit of God rests upon them. The anointing of God rests on a prophet in the Old Testament and in the New. In the Old Testament, a prophet is one to whom and through whom God speaks. Also in the New Testament, a prophet is somebody who brings forth a prophetic word. But certainly in the Old Testament, we see that God chose specific people to be prophets. Not everyone could be a prophet or was a prophet. But there are two types of uh, 
prophets that uh, prophecies that were given. A prophet could either be a forth teller that spoke into the present moment and into the culture and into the life of people, and God would use forth telling to give direction and correction into the lives of people. Uh, sometimes I think that's many times the role of a pastor. Uh, somebody who's teaching the word or preaching the word and, and they bring the word out and make it alive. And that word, because it's anointed and God breathed and God inspired, it uh, goes forth and it brings uh, ministry to and life to people that are listening to it. If their hearts are open and they're, they're listening and their hearts are, are soft and yielded to God, then those words which are been breathed by the, by the Holy Spirit in the word of God will bring life to them. And so God can give a forthtelling message about values and direction and correction through the preaching of his word. Uh, like in Joel's case, his prophetic message of forthtelling into the culture at that time would also be used by God as a foretelling of events that would happen on the day of Pentecost, hundreds of years later. A foreteller would be speaking and foretelling about events in the future, events that would later be fulfilled at a different time and a place and many times the prophet who would be foretelling would not really understand the significance of their message in the time that they were living in. And, uh, and certainly in eternity they would understand it, but people in living much later would be able to capture those words and see those words as prophetic. And uh, just like the prophet Joel was on the day of Pentecost with his prophecy. Let me read to you from Acts chapter 2 verses 14 through 21. Uh, it says, then Peter stood up with the eleven. This was uh, the message that the physician Luke recorded in Acts. He wrote Acts. And uh, Peter is giving this message, this sermon. 3,000 people got saved after this message. I wish when I gave a message, 3,000 people could get saved. That'd be awesome. Uh, but then Peter stood up with the eleven. He raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. And listen, this last verse is very powerful in everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, this is a very powerful uh, a fulfillment of a prophecy where Jesus, because he died on the cross, uh, has made it possible for anyone who calls on him to be saved, to be cleansed and made whole uh, and not have to carry around the consequences uh, from their sins. And uh, because Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross to save humanity, not to condemn humanity. And because of that, uh, and because of what Jesus did, he cleansed us and made us holy. And we put on the holiness and righteousness of Christ so that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that incredible? That the Holy Spirit can come and live within us and, uh, and transform us. And God can speak through us through visions and dreams uh, and through prophecies and through preaching his word. Uh, and, uh, and it's an incredible thing. And not just on men, but on men and women which at the time when Joel was giving this was just totally a foreign concept. And that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord to be saved. You know, you've got to remember in the Jewish culture, only Jews were the ones that were worthy to be saved. They were the chosen uh, 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 culture. They were the chosen group of people that God had chosen, chosen them to be a witness to everybody. So the, the idea that everyone who called on the name of the Lord to be saved was not something that uh, would fit well with them or sit well with them. Uh, and so you see that Jesus has made that possible. Joel gave the prophecy that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verse 7 through 10, Paul has this to say about the contrast between weakness and strength and power and, uh, and grace. It says, uh, Paul says, To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, 
I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. Now listen to this last, last verse. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And of course, we know the Apostle Paul had something that bothered him, uh, and we're not sure what it was. There's no description of it. And I think that's God's plan because we can all relate to a weakness or a problem that we have and uh, we wish it would go away. Uh, and uh, Paul pleaded with God three times and uh, saw it as a messenger from Satan. And God just said to him, his grace is, uh, that God's grace was sufficient for Paul and that God's power is made perfect in weakness. Now that doesn't make any sense to humanity that we all want to be strong. We want to be strong in our own strength, our own abilities. And yet, uh, you know, here we're seeing that Paul is saying, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. He's discovered that when he's weakest, he runs to the God, runs to God, depends on him, and that's when he becomes uh, strongest. I think that's uh, pretty awesome. Now, this Sunday is the final Lenten Sunday before Palm Sunday. And this story, the Gospel uh, of John, relates a story of a woman caught in adultery. You know, her accusers are not only trying to punish her, but catch Jesus in a trap. Now, how Jesus responds to this woman and to the men in the story is a forth telling picture uh, of what Jesus came into this world to do for humanity at the time, but also a foretelling picture of what Jesus would do on the cross of Calvary. Uh, let me read to you John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I'm just going to read through the whole passage of Scripture. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. What Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and at this those who heard began to go away one at a, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Wow, what a, what a horrific, incredible story. A woman caught in the act of adultery, dragged naked by force into a public gathering place, humiliated by her sin, separated from anyone who loved her to protect her, judged and sentenced to death without trial by self-righteous leaders and placed before the King of Kings who is pure and holy. This is how the Apostle John describes the opening scene of one of the most poignant and theologically significant passages of Scripture. Now we're just going to walk through this. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now I just want to share with you a little bit about uh, the significance of this. Uh, the Kindred Valley, if any of you have ever been to Jerusalem, my wife and I were fortunate enough to go many, many years ago. And uh, the Kidron Valley separates the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. You can clearly see the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. At the time of Jesus, it was only what the scripture says is a Sabbath day's journey. Or at the time, the distance was what was known as 2,000 cubics, equal to a little over a half a mile today, because Jesus could walk straight from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. If you visited today, it would be a journey of about five and a half, 5.6 miles, because of how the Kindred Valley has been developed. There are places you can't go, and you have to follow the road that takes you there. It's about a 16 to 17 minute trip. You can't just walk a straight line between the two as in the time of Christ. Well, this is where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. It was across, of course, from Jerusalem. And uh, it was where Jesus would spend time getting refreshed and teaching his disciples. They would, what you'd say, chill out together. 
The Mount of Olives, interestingly, is also where Christ ascended into heaven and where it's prophesied in Zechariah 14, chapter 14, verse 4, that Jesus will return and establish his throne. That's a pretty important uh, geographical location in Jerusalem. Uh, after spending the night on the Mount of Olives, it says this, At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. So Jesus, after retreating to the Mount of Olives, getting some rest, talking with his disciples, uh, he came down through the Kindred Valley. He had to go down a steep hill and then up another steep hill. And uh, he goes into the temple courts where all the people were gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Well, you know, while Jesus and his disciples the night before and many nights before were resting on the Mount of Olives, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the uh, teachers of the law were busy plotting to trap Jesus in a theological misstep so they could get rid of him. See, Jesus was teaching and bringing in the truths of the kingdom of God, and these religious leaders, they had it pretty good. They had good 403B plans. They had uh, good health benefits. You know, they had a good job, and they liked their positions of power and prestige. And here's this itinerant preacher who comes along, and he's preaching about the coming kingdom of God, and people are following him, and he's healing people and touching people and setting them free, and, and it doesn't have anything to do with religion. And uh, they're afraid that people are going to follow him and they're going to lose their power and their influence and their, and their money, quite frankly, and their comfort. Um, so anyways, on, in verse 3, it says that the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Well, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. She was probably naked or half naked because they wanted to embarrass her. They wanted to shock Jesus. Uh, the law said that you had to catch someone in the act of adultery. If you caught them in the act of adultery, that you should stone them to death. So, I want to ask you a question as you think about this passage of scripture is, how many people does it take to commit adultery? You can't commit adultery with one person. Yes, it takes two. So the question is, so where is the man? The law did not excuse the man, for both individuals should have been stoned to death if they were both caught. But hypocrisy and prejudice have existed for a long time in this world. These are men in a uh, patriarch society where the men ruled. And so they didn't bother with the man, they just brought the woman. And uh, so this wasn't about these guys who were bringing this woman to Jesus. This wasn't about trying to follow the law and be good Jewish men and do the right thing, because if it was, they would have brought the man. The woman, of course, if she's there, she's caught, or she was set up into the act of adultery, was only a pawn uh, for these religious leaders' evil scheme to catch Jesus and then get rid of him. Because you see, the Jewish law demanded that the execution of this woman, if she was caught in adultery. But Rome, of course, who controlled uh, Judea and at the time and uh, Jerusalem, they had removed uh, from uh, the Jews' ability to perform a, a capital uh, cases and, and murder people or stone people to death, except for very extreme temple violations. Thus, the Jewish leaders test whether Jesus will reject the law, which would be compromising his Jewish following as they would get dis disillusioned with him, or would they, or would Jesus reject Roman rule and stone her, which would allow them to accuse him to the Romans. Either way, they are trying to play religion and politics, and this is an example of religion and politics at their worst. They had a plan, and a plan was evil, and it was to do evil. Well, the, Jesus' response, which I think is pretty cool, Jesus is said bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Yes, I know, we're all wondering, what exactly did he write? I don't think he was ordering takeout. But he was writing something. The question is, what was Jesus writing? Well, we don't know. 
But uh, that can be one of the questions that maybe you say for heaven when you get to see Jesus face to face. I know I'm very curious about it. Well, there are some theories, or some, there are only theories. You know, God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger, right? He carved into a rock his, uh, his Ten Commandments. Perhaps Jesus writes the first line on the, of the Tenth Commandment in the Septuagint of, in, of Exodus 20. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. This, this text would uh, declare them all guilty of adultery. You can find that in Matthew 5.28. Or perhaps, I always think this is the one I prefer, perhaps he's writing their names and their sins, which only Jesus knows about because he knows everything. Or perhaps he's just writing their sins down. And I think that this is what I would have done just to give them time to sweat. The fear that Jesus would treat them the same way that they had treated this poor woman by exposing her publicly. Can you imagine if he was writing down those sins or had a list there and in the sand and they were looking at that and thinking, oh my gosh, I hope he doesn't keep writing. What if he writes my name down? What if he writes my sin down? The Word of God says there is none righteous, no, not one. That We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's why we need a Savior. Jesus, who is a holy and pure and without sin, and that we can put on his cloak of righteousness to have access to God. Well, whatever Jesus was writing, it's all speculation, and someday maybe we'll find out. Um, another option that's out there is just that he's merely passing time and thinking about his response and letting them sweat. Uh, and he's just uh, maybe doodling in the sand. Who knows what he was doing or what he was writing? But this is what it says in verse 7. It says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground again. Well, you know, if any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. You know, I've been around for a long time in the church and before I came to the church. And I remember when I first got saved, I mean, uh, people were saying, oh, God accepts you just as you are. And you can come in normally and it doesn't matter. God loves you. He cares about you. And I thought that's incredible. That's a message of grace and love and hope. And it makes me want to draw closer to God. It makes me want to come close to him and, and uh, be close to him because he accepts me just as I am. And it makes me motivated to want to change, to be a better person, to make better choices for me and uh, for my master, for, for Jesus, my king and king of kings and lord of lords. And, and yet after I was a Christian for a while and I had become part of a church, I thought all of a sudden it felt like, you know, the same. It was a different message. You know, it was like, OK, grace was good for me when before I was in the church, but then now I come into the church and and now because I'm a Christian, I sh I'm supposed to be acting better and thinking better and behaving better than I did before I was a Christian, but I'm still a wounded, hurting person who makes difficult and bad choices sometimes. And, and oftentimes it felt like the church, with some people anyways, could be a very judgmental place. And so I think that sometimes our own self-righteousness can cause us to be judgmental and condemning of people uh, when we forget where we come from. And, and if we're able to make good choices today, that's only because of the grace and mercy of Christ. That's only because God has changed us and the Holy Spirit, the creator of the whole universe, lives, his spirit lives inside of me and can motivate me to make better choices and can give me power over sin and, and temptation. And when I fall down, I receive his grace and mercy instantly so I don't have to walk around beating myself up, but I can start over again and start new and fresh and begin uh, by confessing my sins, stand up and regain my dignity and my, my power and my uh, victory that I receive through Jesus. I don't get it through me or my righteousness. And uh, so anyways, I just throw that out to you and encourage you to not be judgmental to inside the church or outside the church that... God so loved the world that he gave Jesus his only begotten son that when he came into the world, he sent him to save the world and not to condemn the world. And we have no place in this world to be going around condemning people. God has called us to love people, to encourage people, to speak hope into their lives and peace and mercy and grace and healing. You say amen to that? 
Anyways, they, uh, the trap for Jesus had been set. And, uh, but unfortunately, you know, it didn't work out the way these religious leaders wanted. And they began to sweat because uh, uh, maybe the men around them knew their sins. And uh, they're standing there, you know, they're holding rocks ready to stone this poor woman. And uh, they're sitting there and thinking maybe, you know, they've committed sins together. Maybe they've gone and done things that they shouldn't have done, you know, whatever they were. But uh, they're all standing there in their self-righteousness. And Jesus said, he who is without sin can cast the first stone. Well, uh, you know, I just think that's, that's interesting because, you know, there was nobody there without sin. And so, um, you know, they were at a real dilemma. This trap that they had tried to set for Jesus, Jesus had turned it around by following the word and the spirit of the word, by confronting them with a heart of, of mercy and grace and uh, what God wants out of us. In fact, it reminds me of a proverb, uh, Proverb 28.10, which says, He who leads the upright along an evil path will fall into his own trap, but the blameless will receive a good inheritance. You know, I've been in ministry a long time and I've seen... A lot of things go wrong in people's lives. And oftentimes, uh, you know, like these Pharisees, these uh, teachers of the law who tried to trap this girl, trap Jesus, and they're doing all this manipulation of the word. Their hearts are not pure. They're not really trying to seek God. They're just trying to hold on to their power and manipulate the situation to, uh, to kind of uh, outmaneuver Jesus? Well, don't try to outmaneuver God or Jesus. You know, the best thing you can do and I can do is worship the God in spirit and worship God in spirit and truth. To confess our sins to him and to be honest with him and ask for forgiveness and rest in his mercy and grace and not try to, to lie our way out of the situation or manipulate the situation or people to get what we want. Certainly, uh, my wife and I, we watch Survivor like many of you do. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of morals on Survivor sometimes because, you know, I, I often think to my wife, gee, I, I think I should ever play that a long time ago. And she said, no, never. You'd never last a minute because you can't, you don't tell a good lie. And so I thought, no, nah, I, I don't think I would. But it, it's intriguing to think about being in that contest. But there, are, there is lying and manipulation that goes on. And of course, it's all forgiven because they see it as a game. But life is not a game. You know, and in your life, uh, I want to encourage you to always be honorable and act honorable and trust God to vindicate you, to have his hand of grace and mercy upon you. Even when things around you, when people are against you or coming against you, you just listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, listen to God and do what he tells you to do. Open his word and uh, and do not try to manipulate or lie or set things up and trust God that God will vindicate you and justify you. Amen. Anyway, so. After Jesus confronted them and said, he is without sin, uh, be the first one to throw the stone. Verse 9 says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. The older men, they left first. And they left first. Why? Well, they're old. They've sinned longer. They've lived longer. And so they're probably much more aware that they are, they've done a lot of sinning. And Jesus is, uh, they, can't, they didn't just start out on the road. They've been around for a long time. And, and uh, maybe everybody else in the line, like I said, knew who they were, knew the sins that they committed. And so one by one, they dropped their stones. And, uh, you know, they all ended up leaving. And there was nobody there to accuse her. So I've got news for you. If somebody's accused you of something or betrayed you or somebody's coming against you or tearing you apart because you're not perfect, there is no uh, perfect human humans, it, just Jesus. And everyone, all the rest of us are all in process. We all, most of us do the best we can. But uh, give yourself some grace and mercy and don't allow people to beat on you or, or tear you apart. You have some dignity. God sent his son Jesus into the world to redeem you and to set you free and to make you clean and holy and put his spirit inside of you. So don't you listen to the attacks of the enemy around you. You uh, stand up because uh, just like in this conversation we see that Jesus has with the woman. Jesus straightened up. He stood up and he asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? The woman answers, no one, sir. Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
Jesus Christ, yes, sinless Jesus, the only one who had and has the right to judge her and condemn her, has found her clean. He hasn't condemned her. Although she is probably guilty of adultery, Jesus doesn't condemn her. It's not a question of did she sin? Of course, yes, she probably did sin. If not then, then maybe another time, just like the men. But he doesn't say she's not guilty. He just doesn't condemn her for her guilt. Just like us, he doesn't say we're not guilty. And in fact, the way that we get grace is to admit that we're guilty, to admit that we've sinned, and to ask and receive forgiveness and grace for our sins. We can't go back and undo our sins and our mistakes. The only thing we can do is throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus and ask his forgiveness. And instantly when we do that, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's all unrighteousness. He's not 90%, 99%, everything. And, uh, and so that's what God wants us to do. And we can be honest with him and come to him. And, and God will pour out his grace and mercy and heal us and redeem us and set us free. You know, that's a very powerful thing. And, and then Jesus' last words to her in this story that John records are what Jesus declared over her. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, you might think, oh my goodness, what if she goes back in and commits adultery again? You know, that's a weakness for her. Well, Jesus isn't declaring uh, over this woman uh, to to leave her life of sin, that this this is from now on. She had to be perfect and, and holy and pure. What he was doing so that she would be worthy of God's love, what Jesus was saying to her was, listen, you have found forgiveness and freedom in Jesus, so don't walk back into the bondage you, had, you have come from. I freed you from this. You're better than this. Don't step back into those things which once held you because I have set you free. And the same is true for us. Oftentimes we have weaknesses and past temptations and present temptations, and we can find ourselves being tempted and fall back into old sins or old patterns of behavior that are negative. But, you know, we're not bound by those things because Jesus has set us free. So don't continue in a life of sin. If you make a mistake, confess your sins to Christ and he will, to God, and God will forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You can get up and go forward again with a new vision, a new plan, and a purpose to go and do the things that God has called you to do because you're his child. You're not a child of the devil anymore, so don't believe a lie. Go forward because you're free and you've been healed. And that's really the message uh, that Jesus gives to this woman, to that love had changed her that day. Jesus said to her, you are free, walk in your freedom and in life and not death. Can you imagine how she felt uh, after going through that ordeal and after probably living a life of sin and feeling hopeless and, and like a piece of trash and people probably treated her like one. But here is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He forgives her, gives her grace and mercy, doesn't condemn her and tells her to go and not continue in this life of sin because basically she is created by God and is better than that. Now, I want to uh, just share with you a little story as we wrap up today. Uh, some of you might remember Jackie Robinson. He was the first black person to play Major League Baseball. Breaking baseball's color barrier, barrier he had faced uh, jeering crowds in every stadium. Players uh, would often stomp on his feet and kick him as they were playing. While playing one day in his home stadium in Brooklyn, he made an error. And uh, the fans began to boo and ridicule and publicly shame him. And you can imagine the things that were said. He stood at second base, humiliated, while the fans jeered at him. Well, then shortstop Pee Wee Reese slowly walked over and stood next to him. He put his arm around Jackie Robinson and turned and faced the crowd. The fans grew quiet. Robinson later said that arm around his shoulder saved his career and that he had loved Pee Wee Reese from that point on as a dear brother. That's what Jesus did here in this passage of scripture. Jesus went to this shamed person, this woman caught in adultery, and he stood with her 
as the crowd got quiet and left. And God does the same thing for you and I. He puts his arm around us. He loves us. He cares for us. He doesn't condemn us. Even though we're guilty and we deserve death, Jesus took upon himself our death on the cross of Calvary so that we would not have to pay that penalty. Jesus has said has says it in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I love that passage. God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. To save the world through him. And then we remember from Acts on the day of Pentecost, it says, In the last days I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Jesus came into this world, and through his death on the cross, he brought freedom to all humanity. He was and is today the grace giver, and peacemaker for everyone who's ever been born. His love and grace makes us holy and able to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then to be used in sharing this incredible good news that everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Let, it, let me pray today as we close. I pray for you. Father, I pray for uh, anyone listening this morning. I pray, Father, that we would be drawn to you, that if we feel condemned, that we would be reminded that you didn't condemn anyone in this world, that you came into this world to save us through your grace and through your redemption, your death on the cross, so that you, we could be made holy and filled with your spirit. So I pray this morning, if anyone's listening to this and they feel condemned, they feel like I've just done too much sin, I've done so many things in my life, God wants nothing to do with me, I just come against that lie. Uh, from the pits of hell in the name of Jesus. God loves you and he cares for you and he wants to redeem you. And uh, he's knocking at the door of your heart right now that you would open that door and allow him to come in and fill you with his Holy Spirit, to have fellowship with you and connection with you. He made you and I and all of humanity for relationship, but he waits for us to open that door, the door of our hearts and invite him to come in and, uh, and to be accepted just as we are. So I pray this, this morning that you would open your heart to him, that you'd invite him to come in. I'll just lead you in a prayer this morning. Just repeat this after me. Jesus, I come to you today. I have sinned. I've made mistakes. And I ask forgiveness for those things that I've done. I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give you today... I give you tomorrow, and I surrender my past to you also. Help me to hear your voice. Help me to live for you and to follow you all the days of my life. I commit myself into your hands to follow you with the best of my abilities. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer today, I want you to know that God heard it. I'm a long ways away from you, uh, but God heard it and he loves you and cares for you. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, pray. The praying is just talking to him normally like I'm talking on this video and like you talk to the people around you. To be honest with him, the word of God says that we should worship God in spirit through the Holy Spirit and through our spirit and in truth. He knows everything about you, just like the woman caught in adultery and the men going to throw stones at her. God loved those men just as much as he loved the woman. And they were all trapped in their own sin and their own issues and their own politics and religion. But Jesus came to save all of humanity so that anyone, anyone who calls on him would be saved. So God bless you today. Have a wonderful day today on Sunday. Uh, tune back in next week. Uh, on this Facebook channel for the First Presbyterian Church, Graniteville. I'll have another message ready, and uh, I'll look forward uh, to uh, being able to worship God with you. And uh, when